All right. Well, it's great to be here hanging out with you today. I'm going to pull up some stuff real quick. Just give me a moment, if you don't mind. Uh, I have a couple, just, just one thought in my head today, actually, about what I would want to share and do, but that'll turn into more, perhaps. And the thing that was in my mind, what I was doing right before I hit uh, go live and, and decided to just do this randomly, was first and second position, I was messing around. Jawan, what's up, man? You're the only one here. Good to see you so far. <laughs> we'll get a few more, I hope. Um, so what I have in my hand is a G and a C harmonica. G and a C. So if you have a second and you got a G and a C, grab the G and a C. And we'll mess around with a little bit of this to get warmed up first, okay? All right, what's going on? All right, so so let me put that in the chat box or something. Um, let's see. Let me just type that in real quick. Grab a, grab a G and a C harmonica. Okay. And then I'm going to pin that. If I can pin that. Perfect. Did that work? All right. That should that should have worked, hopefully. So what we want to do, like, or what I want to do <laughs> specifically right now, you guys are welcome to steer the conversation, but is think think about your C harmonica, you know, played in the key of G. Oh, uh, yeah, in the key of G, playing second. So everybody got a C harp, and then you got a G harp. You don't need to know anything about positions and all this business. Just Just hear me out for a minute. Just... Trust me on this little journey for a second, okay? G and a C harmonica. Now, so the idea, and I've talked about this before, but it's really cool to do this in this manner, which is you're, you're playing second position. So try to find this idea real quick. Those are really important notes, some from the blues scale, one from the uh, pentatonic, the two below was in that riff, which is a common way to mess around in second. You're kind of mixing these. Everybody got that riff going? One draw, two blow, two draw, uh, three draw half step bend, and two draw. All right, so you got that in your head. Everybody try that. If you have any trouble hitting the three half step, then, you know, you do your best. You hit the three draw, but you know that you're going for that half step bend. Then, check it out. Pick up your G harp. You're now in first position. Just try this with me. Six blow, six draw to seven blow. Six blow, six draw, seven blow. And try to land on the eight blow bend and seven blow. Now, if you can't blow bend and you're like, man, this sucks because I can't blow bend. Well, then that gives you something to work towards in the technique department. You're going to work on blow bending. But let me just at least give you some inspiration as to why you might want to do this. This is why I decided to do this live post. I learned a new riff just in the moment right before starting this video where I was like, oh, yeah, I've never played that in first. It came from doing what I'm sharing with you right now. Like the use of the five blow, the pentatonic note there in cross is a really cool note to use. But I never play stuff in first on a G like using this 10 draw, the equivalent of the five blow. So I found a new riff today in first that I was never using, never. like. I'm sure I might have used that 10 draw at one point, so I'll share that with you. How cool is that? So first position blues is super bluesy. It's an amazing position to experiment with. For those that cannot blow bend, maybe the first step is just trying to learn how to blow bend. And I could talk a little bit about that today. Uh, how many people here blow bend? Use the, the chat. Let me know if you're a blow bender or not. Do you blow bend? 
Are you working on blow bending? Or no, you've got no experience and you have not tried to blow bend and do anything in the world of blow bending. Because a lot of people confuse the terms blow bending with overblowing, which is really raising the pitch on the bottom of the harp. It's a totally different thing. Um, and blow bending is flatting the note, just like you're doing with your draw notes on the bottom. So all these cool, cro the point of this video was, let me back up, I'm all over the map. All these cool second position ideas you're playing, if you're going to start messing with first position, you could try to find them on hole six through 10. That's a wise area to explore. That'll give you a similar phrasing, okay? It's because the, like, riffs like, coming off like first position 10. Show you how bluesy that is. You can't do that. It starts on a six blow and cross. Less bluesy than going coming from that bend that you can bring in. So becomes like a yeah. Super bluesy either way, second or first. I'm trying to decide how much of that I want to actually give to you in this moment. But let's talk about blow bending. Um, if you're not blow bending, it's one of the most expressive techniques that you can bring in. It's really great to practice them on an A and a G harmonica, where you'll end up using them a lot in your playing. So the G. The power note, the bend, and I'll correlate everything I talk to a little, to some degree at least, back to the C. So that if you're playing second position, which I know a lot of you are, it's going to start to click. When you blow bend or play a nine blow, that's your four draw on a C harp. Bend to draw would now be a blow bend nine to blow nine. You with me? So that's just be aware of where you are. If you're understanding second, apply what you know in second and bring it over to the first position, other way around. So when you blow bend, and the nine would be the one I would recommend trying to get first on a G harp, all the attention comes to the front of the mouth. In this weird position where the tongue kind of tucks the tip of the tongue below the bottom teeth and you kind of like push the sides of the tongue outward and forward and up so that it stops the air. So put your hand in front of your mouth before you play it. Hold on a minute before you play it. Try this. Try it with me. When you're in the right tongue position, the air should stop. Those who know how to blow bend know what I'm talking about. It stops like 90 to 95% of the air. That's how you know you're going to get the bend when you pick it up. So you're trying to create this blocked area with the tongue in front. Anybody getting a blow bend that couldn't get it before? If so, please share that in the comments. And be sure to subscribe and like the video. If you don't mind, it will help me tremendously. I really want to try to uh, get more people tuned in. There's a lot of people watching that are not subscribed. According to my analytics, I'd love to have you as a subscriber so I can find you easily. You can find me easily when I'm posting videos. So now... The blow bends, look, you also watch the jaw for, for a little bit of a secret there. You kind of bring the jaw up a little as that tongue position tucks. So you should be able to get, start to get some of these blow bends coming out with a little practice. It does take a minute to get used to it. They will not come out automatically. It's not something that... Uh, certainly didn't come to me that like automatic. I had to sit there and mess with it for like probably a couple weeks before it started to feel right. All right. So then there becomes, so you develop technique on your blow bends, but then it's like an awareness of what is even available. What can you do? What's, what kind of bends can you get? The 10 has got two half step bends. The nine has a half step and the eight has a half step. Seven's got a microtonal bend and you start to 
say to yourself, well, I got all these bends I can map out in my brain. I can see that I've got like two half steps on the 10 and I'm going to figure out ideas that I'm going to engage with. For me, those are often legato movements like this. Versus going, playing ba da da and hitting all these individual, which by the way, which is good to know that on your second position C harp, that's draw, half step, and full step bend. So you start to map it out, you know, you start to figure out this is this is how to do the technique. This is what's available to me note choice wise. And then it's for me, at least in my book, it's all ear training. You're really trying to stop and have a moment where you're you're just transferring knowledge. You're just sitting there with your C harp playing ideas in the bottom of second position and transferring it. Shane, what's up, buddy? Shane, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. The more of a student you become and an enthusiastic student at that, the quicker this stuff comes to you. So we talked a little bit about transferring like second to first, this bottom end to second position to first position high end. And I, you know, I just want to turn people on to the fact that the first position is ultra bluesy. Go listen to Sonny Boy Williamson the second, trust my baby. And then listen to Kim's version of it, Kim Wilson. And there's countless other examples of great uh, first position blues like Ice Cream Man Blues. And I don't mean to not talk about the bottom end of first because that stuff's awesome. It's all relevant, the whole harp, with the exception of like the middle part of first position is real bumpy without, unless you're going to overblow the daylights out of it to get those missing notes for the blues scale. But the high end's all there, and the low end's all there as well, um, almost, <laughs> except the exception of one note. All right, dudes and ladies, my dudes and ladies. How many women are here? According to my analytics, I also have learned that there's a very small percentage of, but dedicated percentage of women. Thank you to all the, the female harmonic players that are tuning in and that watch my videos. There are some amazing women harmonica players currently that I know of. And I'm not just talking about the YouTube harmonica players, everybody. I'm talking about students of harmonica that are female who are just killing it. In fact, it's uncanny how many women are just so good. I don't know what it is, but like, maybe it's the sensitivity to the thing. I, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know what it is. But it's it blows my mind, like, how many great players, how many great female players there are out there that don't, that we don't talk about enough and that don't get any recognition. So just want to point that out. All right, so what else is on y'all's mind? That was what was on my mind. What's on your mind? I mean, how would you do that? Yeah, there you go. Uh, Lauren Williams is great. And again, and Lauren is just, if you're in the circle of like you're in on it, then you you probably do know that name. But then there's like tons of others that... I guess I know them because they're students of mine or they're involved in my membership. They come to my Q&A meetings. If you don't know about that, you can head to harmonica123.com and check out lessons and memberships. But the memberships are like a twice a month meeting on Zoom. And the women that are uh, participating in that are killing it. Just, it's just, it's so inspiring to me. And not, and not because they're women, just in general, the fact that they're such good players. But I'm pointing out the fact that this is a primarily uh, male-dominated uh, scene. 
the harmonica scene or whatever, the players, the majority. But that's changing. It's shifting. And I see so many female players, and it inspires me. That's all. Okay. Big Mama Thornton. There was Big Mama Thornton. She was amazing. That is true. Jackie Merritt. I don't know that name. Claudia says, I am a woman. Hi, Claudia. It's so good to see you here. I'm going to your channel right now. All right. I see you've got some stuff going on. Maybe not. Oh, you've got your, that's just your playlist. Claudia, are you going to start posting some videos? Everybody subscribe to Claudia's channel. Maybe she'll post a video. Is that okay to put you on the spot like that? Okay. I want you to know that that um, my my practice is manic. I preach a lot of structure. Uh, I provide a lot of structure in classes often, and I believe in that structure that I preach. I do, and I and I and I have to a degree followed it. But some of the best practice sessions I have are manic. I call them blackout sessions, not because I'm drinking or intoxicated whatsoever. I just have these moments where. I'm kind of blacking out everything except for the playing. I'm so into it that like, it feels like I'm on some sort of mind altering substance when I'm not. Getting so into your practice that you lose sense of time and all that. And they're manic. These practice sessions are usually comprised of several minutes of like pattern oriented playing, several minutes of just riffing, uh, rarely are they structured and focused on like a, a one thing. It's all over the map. So I just want to say to everybody that's working on their harp, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. Like you, you can get there several different ways. Tansy Lou. Yeah, Tansy's great. She's so young. Wasn't she like 10 now or 11? I don't know how old she is, but she's very young. And she's she's a prodigy. I know, Claudia, I saw. Okay, no problem. Hey, Claudia, maybe this video right here is meant for you. Maybe it's time to start posting a couple videos. Once you start putting yourself out there, you, it's nerve wracking, but you also learn a lot. You start to you start to hear things you didn't hear. You get feedback that sometimes hurts to hear. Think about all the feedback I've gotten over the years on my videos. You know how many times I've seen comments that were just like quite unusually cruel? Some of them I left and some I didn't, but, um, and some related to my playing and some unrelated, <laughs> just mean comments, but that's the internet. Yeah, flow, doesn't matter how much time you put in a given practice session as long as it's consistent. Yeah, and like flow reminds me of flow state, right? When you're in the zone. There's, there's some magic that will happen to your playing when, the, when you stay in that extended periods of time. That's a low D. This whole thing, by the way, started with me on a high G and a low D. That's before I hit the button today, I was sitting there going. And all this started because of Shane. Because <laughs> Shane was playing high G and I'm like, I don't have a high G anymore. I need to get a high G. There's a cool contrast going on between a high G and a low D to play with this type of exercise. But, the you know, most people do not have a high G and a low D, especially not a high G. So a G harp and a C harp is the way to go. You need a high G now. They're great, dude. I just did a post on the high G recently. Thank <laughs> you.
yeah, it's got its place. Um, had a really nice call yesterday with uh, Buddy Green. Uh, Buddy and I occasionally get on the FaceTime and just chat it up and connect. And one of the things we talked about was the high G. We actually, uh, he brought it up and then because he saw the high G video that I posted and then he hipped me to a really cool Charlie McCoy thing that he sent me. If I can find it. Here it is. He sent me me and Bobby McGee, but Charlie McCoy's version of me and Bobby McGee played on a high G. And I think he said, if I remember correctly, that it was played on a pocket, a pocket harp. So those are those real small ones, which makes it even more challenging. Go listen to that, me and Bobby McGee, but Charlie McCoy's version of that. And it's phenomenal. Um, and the coolest thing about Buddy is that he's just curious about all types of stuff. He just happens to be a great musician who plays harmonica as well. You know what I mean? There's a difference. There's a little bit of a difference between somebody that just is an all around great musician because he does play other instruments too. Yeah. So another thing where I didn't mention on the first position stuff is you might as well go ahead and just like learn the blues scale since it's all up there. You can do that by ear if you really want and play it on the you know second if you're familiar with it and then do it by ear um, starting on seven blow. But I won't play, I'll let you discover that. This is not hard to find once you can get the blow bends to come out a little bit. So if you're not blow bending, step one is getting the blow bends. Balancing practice on different harmonicas. How do you split the time? Well, yeah, because each harp's a little different. Learning the tendencies of each harp, right. Well, for starters, the first thing I, I tell people all the time, man, is like, make sure you're learning songs that put you on different key harmonicas. There is this, this thing where people get trapped sticking on the same harmonica. Maybe it's because they only own a couple keys. So that's different. If, you, if you're not able to purchase more than one or two, then that is what it is. You rotate those all the time. Um, so step one is finding material, I guess if you can learn some melodies and just play them on both heart, like I could just do it, start by playing Oh Susanna or whatever the hell the song was, You Are My Sunshine, but you played it, you played on same position, both harps. <laughs> you sit there and practice melody work on both in same position. The other idea is to switch position work and say, I'm going to not the key though. So I'm going to work on a song where I'm going to improvise on the G in G and on the C in G. So now you're doing, you're double, you're, you're hitting two things at once, position work and practice on two different keys. But the other side of it is the, the so like more of what you're talking about kind of makes me think of the subtleties of each harmonica. How do we pick up on those and improve? And I think some of that comes with rhythm playing. So I would encourage people to try rhythm playing also on a high tuned harmonica to see what you're able to hear and control. What do you notice? When you go from a G, um, I don't know where my high F is, but here's an E harp, whatever. You'll notice things like that the bends feel very different when you're approaching the three on the G and the, and the E. So I think some of it comes down to doing things that force, that allow you to be more sensitive and force you to pay attention to what kind of nuance you're really creating on each key harmonica. Because it's really different. I distinctly recall picking up harmonicas in other keys and going, why can't I bend that hole? I can bend it on my C. Why can't I bend it on the A or the G or whatever was going on? And that's frustrating. It's extremely frustrating for, for people when you've accomplished something on one key and you're like, I cannot get that note to bend on this key. So try to play melodic stuff. That's, that's what I always say, Shane, is like, you know, I try to tell students, if you're not using the bends musically, you'll never get used to those nuances of each key because when I'm playing something off of that G and I'm going, and trying to do something that had all the bends in it, 
By the time I move to an E, everything's shifting. The breath is relaxing a little more. The nuance, the movement of the tongue is, is, is not as drastic on a higher tune. So all those things you're talking about start to come about because we're focusing on something very specific, like a rhythm or one melody line, or maybe even a bending exercise. I need practice on that. So like, yeah, that's, and recording yourself constantly to hear what you sound like, where you need to spend time. Spend time on the chrome. I was playing today, messing around. Um, there was a student that wanted to talk about greasy gravy, and we, I, we were talking. This is an A chromatic, by the way. <laughs> Don't let that mess you up. And we were just talking about where the button falls in the the head of the song, and there was some. There's so many cool things going on. I don't know if you guys remember that. That's greasy gravy. Um, but it's got really cool part. The last line of the head's got stuff off the button. Some really good stuff. And that, yeah, playing the chrome makes you more aware. That's true because it takes more, it feels like me, it takes a lot more sensitivity, awareness, and more air, quite frankly, to move the reeds on a chromatic. And it's a bit of a workout, but yet it's counterintuitive. You kind of need to relax with it. You can't just shove a bunch of air in any harmonica. It's not a forceful thing. It's, it's weird. It's like the more you lay off, the more volume you get and the more sensitive sensitivity and the better the tone in any situation. You can control volume and bring volume by breathing, you know, with dynamic range and practicing swelling, you know. This E harp is a perfect example. You know, your dynamic range seems shorter on a higher key. To me, it does. Not shorter, but just because these movements are so subtle, you have to be gentle. Yeah, it's just so weird to think about this stuff. Sometimes it's... Um, it's like you have to step back and just do these recordings of yourself in the practice session so you can actually hear what you've been doing. It's like we're not even aware sometimes. I think the majority of us are not structured in a practice session. The majority of people just sit down and jam or they have some music that they're working on, like a piece of music, but it tends to be the similar pattern that's showing up in every practice session. And so this, when people start asking me what else, like. How do you structure a practice session? I'm really good at telling you how to pro practice and, and giving you advice on how to structure it. That doesn't mean I take all of my own advice these days, but you have to remember that the learning process in the early days when you're still acquiring technique is different. I think it's okay to be a little more uh, sporadic because you're feeding off of your enthusiasm for and, and using that as momentum to, to be to have moments of spurts of focus. And the, I think that the better I get as a musician, the more accomplished I become, the more crucial it becomes. It's kind of weird to say, but that now you really need to rein in a lot of that and you need to like stop and say, well, look, take stock of what you own and now figure out how you can say something musical with that. What's the next higher level musical thing you could do with your arsenal of technique and skill that you've built? And that doesn't mean you have to shift gears and play jazz. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying if I'm only uh, interested in blues, hypothetically, and I want to improvise, well, what? how can you heighten that? What are the techniques you use in a practice session to get more focused on that? And that I'm very good at creating and doing. I do that a lot of that practice with, um, you know, in the classes. That's where that comes about. Somebody's at my door. I, I don't know if they're trying to sell. I'm going to go peek out the window. Y'all play some harp for a minute.
that's fun. That was a waste of the moment. I definitely didn't need to do that. <laughs> so where were we? CK, what's going on? How do I look? I love the Honor Rocket. Zandu, I love the Honor Rocket. That's what I'm playing right here. Um, the C and the E. Here's the C. It's just such an easy harp to play, and it sounds so good. They really did an amazing job on the read response, the volume that you get, too, out of this harp. I love it. How do you focus single notes on a chromatic? I do it with the side. So I was thinking about this today. I'll tell you, the tip I give people is octaves are straight ahead. And when I want to corner a single note, I do the same approach like I would on a diatonic where I tilt the tongue to the left a little and get a little more of a pocket on the side. So it's all happening here. And I'll admit that I don't use the single notes enough when I'm jamming out on the chromatic. I don't really play chromatic hardly at all. I, I should play it more. I really enjoy it. Um, so that's the shift is like the, the tip of the tongue going and everything straight on versus kind of the slightly side and tip of the tongue and a little bit of a lean to get the single note similar to the diatonic though and yeah chicago the chicago style chrome is great practice in third for sure and you're transferring when i learned chromatic it was transferring knowledge of what am i doing on the c and now how can i bring that into the chrome Jawan is correct. Dynamic range makes you sound interesting. Hell yeah. It's the one thing that I just don't hear anybody talking about. And it's the one thing always noticeable in really great players and missing from players who are not great. In my opinion, just my observation. Working on a sax solo, Pink Floyd's money. I know that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, what's the question in there exactly? Just an odd, the, the fact that it's an odd time signature, it throws you off. I mean, what are you trying to play? Are you playing the melody line? Are you trying to improvise over it? What is it? What's your role in that? Awareness, then action. For sure, Shane. Here's one good tip. I have, well, in my defense, I've become more structured in the following manner in this year. I have acquired uh, three new journals, uh, a day timer, no, three, like six or seven new journals and notebooks, combination things, and a day timer. And one thing you can do if you really want to not avoid the sort of I'm doing the same shit over and over again problem is put bullet points or put like on your practice days, hypothetically, let's say you were practicing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, have always have something in front of you, at least a bullet point of the main objective of the day. So that if the objective is constantly shifting, you're bound to do something different to accomplish that objective. For example, I could have a combined objective on day one of fluidity and bending practice. <laughs> Legato style fluidity and back. I could do, I could come up with some really cool things. Triplet oriented movement. You can play around blow bending. That's all on the C. Next day, let's say your topic. Just these are hypothetical. We're just kicking this around. But let's say the next day, um, it was song study. You just put that and then you're like, well, what are the things I'm working on? And you're like, okay, I'm, I'm working on Big Walter's Easy and uh, who knows what. Um, can't hold out much longer by Little Walter. Uh, today, I'm just going to take the intro of both and work them to death. 
and I'm going to find things inside of the intros where I can support those things. Uh, maybe it's containing octaves and you're going to do an octave warm up before you play the intro. You see what I'm saying? Always try to combine. My biggest tip is combining things. Kill two birds with one stone. Always think about how you can get more out of a practice by intertwining bending and fluidity, for example. And, uh, and let's say you had one more day that week and uh, that was all about scale work and speed. You know what I mean? Like get creative with, with how you come up with that. And that totally will shift things and break you out of your, your comfort zone and sort of us, what we always do is, uh, it's in our nature to want to do the things that are easier. They're, they seem to be more enjoyable for most people. It's just more fun. Like I can actually do this, I wanna do it. So you gotta, the trick is finding a way to make the stuff that you're not touching more enjoyable. Like what do you need to do to get to have that become more fun? See what I'm saying? That's my thought on that. Not that you asked really, but I think it's a great topic. Transitioning from practicing alone to hearing when to come in live. Well, that's a good one. Well, I wanna know more about that. When to come in live? You come in when you feel it, man. Just try not to step on people. Don't step on vocals and don't, don't step on somebody taking a solo and listen and play quieter than you think you should when you're not soloing. That's those are the rules. There's some general rules. Let me say it again. <laughs> don't step on the soloist. Don't step on the vocals. Play quieter than you think you should if you're going to play during the song in and, in and around the vocals or fills. And when it's your time to solo, own that. And play it like, like you're letting it all hang out. Okay. I tongue block all of the chrome. I don't almost hardly pucker any. I used to pucker it. And I think either way is cool. You can get a good sound puckering, but the tongue blocking is just, it's better. And it seems to fit for the chromatic. Um, if you're gonna play blues, you might as well just try to keep your tongue on there. I don't feel that way about the diatonic. I don't, because we're contending with bending. Something totally different, a different te uh, technique is happening. So I personally do not feel that way when it comes to the diatonic, but for the chrome, I don't see any downside to just tongue blocking the whole thing. No, CK, that's not the same. And I'm friends with Roly Platt, so I know what you're talking about. Uh, it's similar. You got something going on with that. So I just want to point that out real quick is that um, he plays like this, like a real severe tilt. That's different. The tilt I'm talking about is like an, a tilt this way. Okay, the pocket thing for the chrome or, yeah, the, we, were, we were talking about single notes. It's not one of these things. It's, it's, it's inward this way with this part of the heart. Okay, just to be clear. Roly's a great player. Love Roly's playing. Cool guy too. He's a good friend. <laughs> Shane, Shane with the million dollar questions today. Any tips for practicing accompaniment playing when you're by yourself? Yeah, of course. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is you need something to feed off of. I like using like actual pieces that are sparse. Country music is great for this. Um, if you can, if you can find the right tracks where there's not like already a bunch of harmonica or fiddle music or things happening, but you're finding songs that allow for the space and then interpreting that space. So you need to find things where, again, it's not filled up, or you could use a backing track and do it. And the way I would recommend doing it with the backing track maybe you guys have other thoughts, is you put on the backing track. It does not matter if you cannot sing, you can sp sp use spoken word. The track's cruising along and you're like, you know, whatever the track is, a shuffle and you're just going, I got the blues. And you can riff and play the fills in between, right? The most generic riff line came out of my mouth right there. I got the blues. But whatever you're singing, you sing the song and you take your own fills you can't accompany play 
all the way through because you'll be singing part of it. And sometimes you want to write a company, use accompaniment underneath the vocals, but it's less common. What's more common is really those fills. So I like to find the songs that just don't aren't filled up and work the, I would say, working the accompaniment that way. The other way would be to study what all the other players are doing. We know Mickey Raphael is one of the best at it. So you might put on a rotation of like, uh, you know, seven of your favorite Willie Nelson albums, and then Mickey Raphael is going to show you how it's done, and you're going to take notes and listen and practice with him and pause after it and try to play some of it. What do you do, Shane? What do you do? Yeah, playing with the songs makes it more relevant contextually. Playing with other musicians is not easy because it's no longer static. Everything's moving. The track, the backing track is becomes predictable and can be, after a while, too predictable without the organic sort of hiccups or dynamic swells or whatever it is that, you know, is happening live in a live setting. Practice to overcome weakness and to make you feel better about it. Play what you're good at and try to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. And also try to incorporate things that are the things you avoid the things you're like, I just hate that I don't want to do it. The only way to get past those is to find examples musical examples where you're like, holy crap, listen to what this person's doing. And it involves that thing that you weren't so interested in. And then you'll get a little more interested. <laughs> the sax solo, the melody line, yeah. Okay, here's a tip. The only tip that comes to mind for that, uh, you're working on the song uh, Money, Pink Floyd. Work on humming along with the solo for a long time before you ever try to play it. Just sing it. Just hum it or sing it and try to stop playing it. And eventually just pick it up and see if you can just do what you're humming in your head, but on the harp. That's the only thing I can think of. I do this all by ear. I just think it's easier that way. It's the easiest way to acquire it when you can move around and, and hear approximately where the notes are that you're hearing in your head. If you can correlate some of that to, the, to your instrument, it makes it way easier. And whoever said Kim Wilson... Sandy, Kim Wilson on accompaniment is right. Here's a good one. The Memphis Barbecue Sessions. Pine Top Perkins, Big Jack Johnson, and Kim Wilson. Talk about the way he accompanies throughout that. Yeah, that's a perfect Kim Wilson example of accompaniment, especially because it's broken down and it's acoustic. You got to play what you're not good at. You got to work on the things you're not good at. They should be at the top of the list, in my opinion. And the things that you're really good at doesn't mean you can't practice or, or play those or improve on them. You certainly, I do it all the time. But there should be less time, I think, on those than trying to work in things that are relevant to what your goals are. They pertain and relate to the goals, but you just need more work on those things. I love these comments today. You guys are very active. There you go, Wesley. That's deep. Good harp. Like salt takes just the right amount. Yeah, that's a good one. Hello, Perry Custom Cards. I like that. Perry Custom Cards. I'm checking out your channel right now. Oh, look at your cards. Hey, that's pretty impressive, Perry. I'm just staring at thumbnails, but I can see that you must be, are you an artist? That's kind of cool. I'm, I'm a subscriber. Who's got a channel I need to subscribe to today? I want a channel that has something going on. Not just a playlist, but something that even if you only have a couple videos that you've posted of your own playing, I want to I see what you guys are up to. 
leave a comment that says, I've got something and I'll, I'll check it out. Good call, CK. Nursery rhymes are perfect for single notes. Yeah, and expanding deviations for improv. Yeah, right. You can bring that into your improv, totally. Um, one of the coolest uh, examples of guys, of a, so a person, a player that that brought in those little one-line nursery stuff into their improv is Steve Mariner. How many people follow Steve Mariner out of Canada? His band name is called Monkey Junk. He learned harp. He studied under Kim Wilson for a while. He's got a tremendous sound. Um, just a great musician. He plays multiple instruments. And uh, Steve's, Steve's awesome. And uh, he played on an album with... Um, Oh, shit. Give me a sec. Harry Manx? Harry Manx. M-A-N-X, I think. Okay, that just came to me. I got lucky. I was about to go searching. Um, and he... He plays a song where he does a million quotes, and they're all really good. He you has know, like seven to nine quotes in a row in his solo, but he's killing it! That CD is really good. Just look up Harry Manx, the one with Steve Mariner. I don't know which one that is. I can't remember the name of it. Okay. Yeah. Who else has got stuff? Let's see what I'm missing here in the action. You're welcome, Perry. Did you write, did you do that? Did you, are you responsible for making those cards? That's pretty amazing. That's a good one, Shane. Oh, not really. No, not really. Okay. Well, that's cool. I'm going to check it out anyway. I see what you're saying. So what's the biggest problem I run into when trying to take an intermediate player to an advanced player? Trying to get them. I'll tell you the truth. No one's going to like this answer. No one's going to like this answer. You're not going to like this answer. But, it, but I think there's a lot of truth in what I'm about to say. It involves going back and examining the foundation of their playing. Always. We have to sit there and figure out what is keeping this person from getting to a higher level, right? It's not the things at the surface. Imagine all of your skill set, what's at the surface is your highest level skill set. And the foundation is the lowest level, let's say, right? Highest, lowest. It's, it's not the things at the top that are holding you back. It's something in the foundation that's causing this weakness somewhere in the thing and some disconnects so that you're not getting there. That's, that's one thing that I think of. Finding foundational concepts and techniques that were overlooked and that need to be strengthened. Number two emotional connection i know a lot of great players or sorry i know a lot of very good players who never became let's say extremely high level players or great players because there wasn't an enough of an emotional connection to the pieces that they're playing or and or the the type of practice they do if you're not emotionally invested remember the blackout session i mentioned earlier that's emotional investment, 100%. That's what I mean to you guys. When I'm in, like, though, I don't know that I can call those practice sessions, but they are. I don't even mean to sit down and practice. It's like, it starts with fiddling with something. I know that everyone's had this experience probably, to some degree. But then you're so lost in it, and it starts to change into something else that you're doing, and then you just start playing, but you're, you're practicing and you're co a combination of scales and patterns and movements and phrases. And, and those, are, those are valuable because emotion is the one component that, and you can read about this, I've read about it, not just from my own, this has been my experience that I've had as a learner, that when I could not get to a next level and I have focused emotionally on it, that's what got me to where I was trying to go. I don't know how else to explain. And it happens quick. You can jump many levels quickly if you're so heightened with your emotion during the practice 
How many people have had that experience? Because I've read about other teachers talking about it, not harmonica teachers, usually classically trained uh, musicians like violin or something, and they couldn't get the piece. And then all of a sudden the, they use the frustration and it turns into this positive sort of like shift of emotion and focus and then boom, that technique emerges or pops out and the sound happens or the thing happens. It's amazing. So those are two things that come to mind. Yeah, Pete. It does, It you know, I've done a little bit of that busking. I did it without backing tracks and I did it in New Orleans. And man, that's, that's some, it takes a lot of courage to do that too. Randall, how you doing? Oh, cool, CK, yeah. Check it. Be sure to check out Steve Mariner, y'all. He's really good, too. How to focus on keeping calm, limiting breath. Yeah, staying accurate in a live performance settings. Yeah, it's a really important one. Um, how to focus on keeping calm, limiting breath. Well, listen to the words you're saying. Listen to what your, your own words are saying, okay? I'm gonna read you what you said. Any advice on how to focus on keeping calm, limiting breath, staying accurate? Limiting breath is part of the secret. Not, not so much limiting as the awareness game of like how you breathe. Okay, let's say you're nervous as hell. What happens? Your heart rate goes up and your, and your breathing goes off, right? It's not working right. Nothing that you're capable of doing is now happening in the moment. So what do you do? Simplify the ideas. And, and you can do that to some degree by limiting the breath, but it's really about holding something, work, and at the same time as keeping the idea simple, you'll want to work in the moment as that's happening to stay focused and keep calm, sustaining notes longer than you normally would. Too much movement can be frantic for the mind and create more chaos and get you more nervous because you're just playing and you're like, good God, I can't. you're so aware of, you're not, <laughs> you're so aware of the fact that you're nervous that you're, you're actively feeding the nerves. So center yourself and sustain things. That's what I did the first time I had to sit in and really like harness my nerves. I had to just limit and simplify the ideas and use longer notes, like long warbles, long single notes, and then just take a breath and just relax and allow yourself to just try to, the long breaths will slow down the heart rate eventually. So you can practice that too. You know, long box breathing and things that allow you to slow that down. Just let yourself have space in your music, okay? Let there be a lot of space. It'll feel weird in the beginning when you start playing with people, you're like, damn, this space feels uncomfortable. This space feels like it's beating the hell out of me. I better play something. Don't. Let the space speak for itself. It's a pretty good one right there. Let the space speak for itself. Unlearning habits, for sure. Unlearning habits. Unlearning habits is a huge topic, too, because once it's in muscle memory, it just wants to keep coming back. So you got to create new muscle memory to unlearn a bad habit. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, exactly, Randy. If you want to be a master, master the basics first. A lot of people skip that. They really don't spend enough time with the, the rudimentary concepts and techniques. And I haven't done a post yet, but you'll be seeing me do a post called Ronnie's Beginner Blues Harmonica Course coming soon. Yeah, it's coming soon. I better do that post like tomorrow. <laughs> haven't talked about it, but I'm going back to basics. In 2008, I released a DVD and I remember how nervous as hell I was making that. Um, so the course that I'll talk about is a four class course coming up this month for beginners or those that want to revisit these topics. 
These are good comments and, and suggestions here. Yeah, the breath work is when it's difficult when you play slow. So just say less and work on extending the, the control that you desire that you may not have yet. Like long notes, work on extending your breath, consistent, even breathing on the inhales and exhales. How long can you breathe in? And then before you just let it out, hold your breath for a minute and let it out really, really slowly. You can use this pucker shape to control the breath to a degree as well. Say less, learn how to say something really cool with one whole one or two notes. And then like, don't play anything, have the attitude when you're not playing, just try to get into feeling what's happening. I mean, a lot of the questions that are concerns, things that people bring up, the answers come in time. It's like, you don't want to hear that in the moment. You want somebody to say, do this and it'll all be great. But like, it just takes a little time. Great answer, Juwan. It's the internal groove taken over. Explore the sounds in your head. I highly encourage everybody to subscribe to Juwan Bailey's page and Shane Sager's page. These are two people actively commenting underneath right now in this live stream. You can scroll for their comments, Jawan Bailey and Shane Sager. Why? Because they post videos of themselves playing and they're both great players. And they both have great things to share. So go, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead right now. Go ahead. Take a minute. Subscribe. Not just to my channel. Jawan and Shane. You can come right back. I'll lose all my, all the people watching are like, I'm out of here. Um, when I used to jam, oh, I'm sorry until you lost your leg three years ago. I don't get out to do things like I did. I'm sorry to hear that. But at least you can still play and you've got the harmonica, which hopefully gives you comfort and enjoyment. And you know what, Perry, you know, maybe it's worth trying to find some people that want to come over and jam just at the house and stuff or you go to them and try to just have a jam session that's informal those are really valuable types of jam sessions versus going to like a bar scene which can be very discouraging and turn people off to ever wanting to jam again sometimes pete wants everybody to go to his channel too pete let's go to check out your channel because you are on my live streams a lot all right pete i see that you've got some videos Y'all go check out Pete, Pete the Animal Austin. Okay, I'm subscribed. I'm a subscriber, dude. I'm there. I'll go back and check it out. Very cool. Look how I'm, you guys are so uh, engaged today. This does not always happen. Okay. What's the biggest barrier to getting students to students getting the most out of a song study? Um, they give up. So their lack of commitment is the barrier. And why? Because they're not finding tangible progress. They're not hearing and feeling like they're getting it. So they ditch it. So how do you avoid that? How do you have successful practice sessions on a hard song study i'll tell you how i think don't try to work the whole song if there's an introduction you could play that for months before you ever need to look at the solo let's say you took one of my classes and you're like it was a cool class but boy there's a lot to learn don't get overwhelmed start with the first line of the introduction or if there's no intro the first line of the solo and pretend like that's the whole solo and play each one of those notes to your best ability and work it like, in other words, own small sections of song studies that make you feel like, God, I can't wait to get back and work on the next section. It can be note at a time or lick at a time, usually a group of notes or a lick at a time or a phrase or two at a time. That's how I know. I know that's how I work best. If you give me the whole piece and it's foreign to me and I am going to work through that whole thing, I'm going to I'm going to wear myself out and give up before I actually accomplish the goal. So I think the barrier is that they 
are not taking the time to really own each portion of it slowly before moving on. They're kind of half-assing uh, the first, second, third phrase, and then they keep going. It's not perfect, but they're still adding to it. Don't do that. Make it right, then move on. So to make ends meet, you make cards. Very cool. I'm going to go back to those to you guys. I'm going to go check out Perry. I'm going to go look through your channel. Don't think I won't. I'm going to go check out Pete's videos. I'm all over it. More pedals and more heart gear. Very cool. Okay. I'll be looking for that. Rocket Girl is here in the house. Another female player out there killing it. I was talking about uh, female harmonica players earlier. Go subscribe to Rocket Girl. She's got a following that's building like crazy. You might be missing out if you don't subscribe. And what's cool about uh, Lisa's channel is that she works with different harmonica teachers out there. I'm one of them, but there's many others. And often we'll be posting things that she's working on from the classes and lessons that she acquires. And it's like, I always say, if you're willing to put yourself out there and take a little criticism, people are going to criticize. Some people will give you positive, obviously, support and say that sounds great. And that's important to hear to get that feedback. And you'll get the criticism. You can learn from critical feedback, etc. Just putting yourself out there. Plus, you get to watch yourself and go back and listen to your playing and learn from that. Perry, glad to hear it. When you get back on your feet, I'll be back on the stage jamming. Very cool. Maybe you'll post a video of that and we can see it. Brian, how you doing? Coming in loud and clear there. The best advice you ever got was no matter what happened, stay on the beat, Pete. It's pretty good advice. It's keep time. Train rhythms on your back. I got that tip. That's a good one, Sandy. I got that tip from J.P. Allen. Uh, so my very first year picking up the harmonica, he, he was my teacher. I took at least a few lessons from him, private lessons. Not too many, but a handful. And he would make me lay on my back flat and play same thing, chain, chugs, rhythms, all the chordal stuff on my back and pay attention to the way I was breathing. It made me more aware. He told me to visualize the air coming from way down in the diaphragm and up the sides of the body and then he, like have a visual of how you move your air. And it helped tremendously. Practice laying on your back. That's a good one. Blue Third from Greece, what's going on? Good to see you here. Right on, Randall, you got a new album? Come back and tell us about that, we can check it out. <laughs> CK, with the warning from the police. Hey, I wouldn't mind a custom card. That's kind of cool. That sounds cool. Like I said, I'm going to go back and check out your stuff. Today has been really good. It's been a nice little hang here. Really good uh, comments, questions, suggestions, and everything from, from all of you, and I appreciate it. And Brian, thanks for being a longtime subscriber. I'll tell you guys something. I I came across, and there's more than just this person, but I happened to notice this the other day. Somebody who purchased a class and checked out one of my classes at harmonica123.com. And I, I noticed that this is somebody's name who I've seen in my inbox for a long time, so I decided to do some research. And it turns out that this person their first purchase was like January of 2008 or something like that. Whenever my, it was, it was whatever the earliest thing that I released that was on sale. It was in 2008. And I thought to myself, wow, 
this person has stuck with me for all that time. Like, it was just mind blowing that like, they're still, they're still, not only are they still playing, but they're following me and they're tuning into what I'm doing. So for anybody that's out there watching this who has been subscribed for a long time or been checking out my classes, thank you for doing that. Um, I, I can't I can't tell you how much of a difference that has made to my world. And I'm so thankful for all of you. And if you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe to the channel and I'll keep coming on. I'll keep sharing tips. I'll share some uh, some playing and soon I'll be on the road again coming up as we warm up into the spring and summer. Um, little small tours are coming up with the Dig 3. So follow the Dig 3 on Facebook. That's where if you're on Facebook, that's the easiest way to find out about the tour schedule, new music released, etc. I have some hard copies left of the brand new CD. I will not ship them to you outside of the US, not even Canada. And it's not that I don't love you and don't want to send it to you. It's that our postal system sucks and often ruins the experience and you don't get it or you get it several months later or it's lost, whatever. I just can't do it. I would encourage you to download that music. Um, but if you live in the US and you want a copy of my CD, I would be willing to do that. And uh, again, thanks guys for hanging out today. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate you, brother. I'll talk to you soon, I'm sure. Right on. I'm going to go check out everybody's channel now. Um, Y'all make it a great day. And I'll see you soon.